Well, thank you. Uh, thanks, for, thanks for coming. Um, we're going to talk about innovation and how uh, innovation uh, helped create this town. Um, so uh, this town was really built around uh, Ensign Bickford uh, back in 1836 when uh, Richard Bacon, a local farmer who was also uh, a superintendent at a mine, uh, read about safety fuse uh, and said, hey, wow, that's, that's uh, quite an innovation that can save lives. Uh, so I'll talk a little bit about how uh, William Bickford from England uh, uh, developed, uh, innovated, patented uh, safety fuse. What is safety fuse? Uh, that we still make it today. That's pretty similar to what it was like back in uh, the 1840s. Uh, but, uh, and how that innovation uh, actually uh, created who we are today, uh, who Ensign Bickford is today. And I'm uh, from the Ensign Bickford Aerospace and Defense. So uh, unfortunately, I'm not a family member. Uh, so I don't have all the history. Uh, my boss, uh, Caleb Ensign White, uh, is part of the Darling family. And uh, he, uh, he has a little more of the history and knowledge than I do. But uh, I'll do my best to, to represent the family uh, correctly. And there's a lot of uh, history you can read online, too. There's some great papers uh, that have been written about the company. Uh, also, afterwards, if you'd like to grab a book, uh, I brought some books. Uh, it's our 175th anniversary book. We celebrated that a few years ago, uh, where the company uh, brought in a lot of the family members uh, to the town. Uh, we had a, a big shindig, and we celebrated 175 years, which uh, I was fortunate to be part of. Uh, it was really, really cool uh, meeting some of the family members. And we have family members that still are linked back to William Bickford. Uh, that live in Cornwall, England, uh, that came to uh, Connecticut. So pretty, pretty interesting history. Um, and it's great to be part of uh, uh, a town like Simsbury. Um, very fortunate to uh, have a facility that I can work at where we're developing uh, technology every day and go home and live in such a great town. So there's not too many uh, factories and facilities that you see in little New England town like this, uh, especially one, ones that work with explosives. Um, so so I'll, I'll get started. Um, so William Bickford, um, again, uh, back in 1831, uh, patented uh, safety fuse. And one of the things he saw uh, as a real safety issue in the mining, in those early mining days, black powder was the primary uh, explosive material to, for metal mining, typically coal mining. And the way they initiated uh, uh, the charges, they typically, if you remember, you know, watch the old John Wayne movies, where they pour the, the powder trail in a, in a little groove and then they light it. Or they use something called goose quills, fill a goose quill up uh, with black powder and they'd light it. And the problem was uh, the speed at which it burned. It wasn't a controlled speed. So based on your foot speed and the burn speed would determine whether you got out or not before the charges went off. So a lot of people got killed and uh, William Bickford saw that. Uh, he was uh, very familiar with the textile industry making rope. Uh, so he took that idea and thought process and married it with black powder uh, and developed safety fuse. Uh, so it, it used a lot of the, if, if you've been over to the uh, museum over here in town, if you haven't, I suggest you do. Uh, they have some of the old wooden equipment in there that was used uh, to make the safety fuse. Uh, so you'd basically take uh, what was called, it's called jute, um, which is kind of a vegetable uh, stranded material that you dry out. Um, it's like twine, looks like twine after it's already wounded. But you'd run it through some black powder, uh, you'd run it through some varnish, and you'd actually create a safety fuse that burned at a control speed hence uh, providing a controlled uh, time when you could leave. So uh, that was William Bickford. Uh, he, his son, uh, John Bickford, his son-in-law, George Smith, and Thomas Davey, um, they said, hey, Dad's got a pretty good idea. We can do something with it. So they created a, a company. Um, from there, uh, they took the invention, and they started producing it and demonstrated uh, significant safety, 90% reduction in fatal fatalities uh, in, in the mining industry. So some great success. Even today, uh, William Bickford's descendants are linked to EBI, as I mentioned. 
uh, they participate in our 175th anniversary. Uh, back to 1980, we still owned a certain uh, percentage of what was called Davy, still today called Davy Bickford in England, uh, in France. Actually, it's, I think it's, uh, it's in France. Um, it was called uh, Davy Bickford Smith, uh, then they renamed it Davy Bickford, and it's still in existence today, and they primarily support the mining industry in Europe. So as I mentioned, uh, Richard Bacon, um, he saw, he read about this, and he said, wow, what a great idea. I think I can make some money. Um, and if you know the Old Gate Prison over in East Granby, that used to be a copper mine. He was a superintendent of that mine, so he said, hey, I can, I can use it in my mine, and I can also, uh, looks like I can uh, make some money at selling this fuse around the world. Uh, mainly North America was his primary uh, um, area to, that he was thinking about. First plant in East Weetog, if you uh, know where Rosedale farms. So kind of across the street up into the woods is actually a monument in there where the first plant was located. Um, okay, so let me move on here, moving right along. So Richard Bacon uh, was an okay businessman. He uh, wasn't good at his books, keeping his books. There was a relationship between Richard Bacon and uh, uh, the uh, Bickford family, and uh, they were concerned about not getting their fair share of whatever royalties had been established. So uh, uh, John Bickford sent over Joseph Toy to monitor the situation here in North America. Uh, Joseph Toy was a great businessman. He came over in 1839. He brought his family over, his uh, wife and three daughters, Susan, Ann, and Jeanette, um, and started working with uh, Richard. Their working relationship wasn't the best because he was over here and, and he actually saw the deficiencies of the books, that things weren't being kept up to date. So uh, they had a little bit of a stressful relationship and there was a large fire in 1951 and uh, the Bickfords had a kind of a separation with uh, uh, Richard Bacon and went their separate ways. Um, the daughters of Joseph Toy are really the, f I would say, the foundation of the company uh, because the daughters and who they married really, you'll men uh, for folks who live in Simsbury, you'll notice some of the names like Ellsworth, Darling, um, they are the spouses of the daughters, so you'll kind of see the history, and you'll, you'll notice other names like Phelps, Mary Phelps, who was also a, a resident of Simsbury. So it's, a, again, a very interesting history of uh, the folks from uh, Simsbury. So Richard Hart married Susan Toy, and that was a great uh, success for the company because Richard Hart was a great businessman. So he had a lot of vision. So when he came into the company, uh, he really expanded things. Um, he, he knew he needed to get into California, uh, you know, the gold rush coming down. So there were a lot of things that needed to happen, and, and he, he made it happen. He also knew that he needed to have strong relationships with DuPont uh, because DuPont was a large provider of black powder. So he created a, a very good relationship with DuPont really key to, uh, to the success of the company. Um, he had three surviving children, Joseph, Susan, and Julia, and he died in 1917. So as I mentioned, the daughters, the Toy daughters, uh, also um, Anne Toy married Lumal Ellsworth, uh, Janet Toy married Charles Curtis, uh, Edison Curtis, and let's see who else here. Um, and as I mentioned, Susan Toy married Ralph Ensign. So those are the, really the three, uh, I would say, main family members. Um, the Ellsworth, Lamal Ellsworth, was sent out to California really to manage a new operation in California to handle all the gold rush activities that were going on. So he was sent out there. And soon after, he came back to work his uh, father's fertilizer seed company here and um, 
Let's see. Uh, oh, yeah, James Bester Merritt actually uh, took over his spot in California. Let's make sure I'm not missing anything. Joseph Ensign, this is Ralph's son. Uh, again, he was another, I would say, cornerstone of the business. He came out of Yale. After he got out of school, he brought some technology into the business. He ended up marrying uh, Mary Phelps, who I mentioned. And uh, Mary Phelps, uh, let's see, Mar married Mary Phelps of Simsbury, and they had one daughter, Mary Phelps, who ended up uh, marrying Frederick Lovejoy. Um, now, Mary Phelps uh, is the great-grandmother of our current chairman, Joseph uh, Lovejoy, Jr. So you're starting to see now we're actually into the, the current family, um, which, and I think, uh, here we go right here. So, yeah, Joseph's sister, Susan, Susan Einstein, married uh, Reverend William uh, Ingus Morse, and Joseph's sister, Julia, married Robert Darling. So that's how the Darlings got pulled into the business, uh, was from uh, Joseph's sister, um, a daughter of uh, Ralph Ensign. So currently, there are three family members that are the primary uh, owners of the company. And it's Joseph Lovejoy, uh, the Darling family, and the Ellsworth family. So those are, are the three uh, families that still own, own the company. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, I work for Caleb Ensign White, who will be doing a better job than I am now uh, talking about his family, but uh, he stems from the Darling family. Um, so Joseph took over presidency in 1917. Uh, he drove one of his uh, main things was expanding the business. He expanded the business in, in Canada and actually into Mexico. Um, uh, Joseph uh, took over as chairman and Henry E. Ellsworth ended up becoming president in 1935. Um, and uh, Joseph passed away in 1941 and then Ro Robert Darling became the chairman at that point in time. So that's kind of the, I would say, some of the older history uh, I wanted to touch on a little bit. Um, the technology of uh, safety fuse and, and how it uh, really saved a lot of lives and We'll talk about how that technology has kind of come into what we do today and how much our business has really changed. It's uh, quite a bit different uh, than it was back, back then. Let me get a drink of water. <laughs> okay, we'll talk a little, I guess, a little bit more about history. Um, during this time, uh, there was a facility uh, that was um, built in Avon uh, by Romeo Andrews, who actually worked, previously worked at the Ensign uh, Bickford facility, um, and they were a competitor. So they started producing a competitive product. And if you remember, I said, uh, I think it was 1851, um, that uh, Bacon and Toy separated. So... Bacon's sons started working with Andrews and they actually created uh, another company called the Climax Fuse Company. Um, and as you can see also that uh, there, a relationship started back between the two competitors, eventually joined a, uh, had a joint venture in 1892, a 50-50, and they finally merged in 1907. So um, that was kind of the, the end of the uh, uh, Andrews and Son uh, business as well as the Climax Fuse Company that was right over, you know, the Redstone buildings over in Avon, uh, the police department and right around there. Um, that's uh, where that facility uh, was manufacturing safety fuse and eventually detonating cord as well, which uh, I'll talk a little bit about. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about also some of the fires and some of the things that happened. So black powder is not a, it, it can be a dangerous material to handle. Um, you can, with electrostatic discharge as well as friction, you can get it to light on fire. Uh, so back then there were numerous uh, uh, fires and fatalities. Uh, one thing you'll notice as you drive up Route 10, all the buildings are made out of stone. So that red stone was only brought into play uh, because of the fires. What they ended up learning 
because of the black powder would tend to get everywhere, it would tend to impregnate the wood. So if you had a, a local spark or friction, it would easily propagate throughout the whole facility and you'd end up having a very, very hard fire to put out. So um, one of the um, things that I believe it was, uh, I'm not sure if it was, uh, I think it was uh, uh, Joseph Toy, but uh, th uh, they said, listen, we're going to, going forward, we're making everything out of stone. So hence why all the buildings you see are all made out of stone now. Um, if you uh, make your way up into the cemetery here in town, uh, Mr. Toy, <coughs> excuse me, erected a statue in, in memory of all the people who died uh, during the uh, 1859 fire. Uh, so there were uh, several people that perished in that fire. And uh, uh, one thing you read in the history books, too, is that uh, the he provided all the caskets, hand carved from oak, um, and there was a procession line, they say, that went, you know, all the way down Route 10 and just went on for miles. So it was quite, a, quite an event for the town. Uh, as you think back then, it was a family here. Uh, the, and I think, as uh, was mentioned during the intro, uh, in order to get people to come here, they had to create housing. So Ensign Bickford, a lot of the houses you see on Route 10, a lot of the small houses on Route 10 were all built by Ensign Bickford. And until the 1980s, uh, we still owned a bunch of those homes. Uh, they're all not owned by Ensign Bickford anymore, but uh, again, uh, just a, a real neat history. So again, many disasters. I think the largest one was by the Climax uh, Fuse Company that happened back in 1905 which the, was one of the worst disasters in safety fuse history. Um, wartime contributions. Uh, this is where you start talking about some of the changes in technology. This is back in the 1930s, mid-30s. Uh, detonating cord was invented actually back in, I think it was 1909. And what it uses, it uses a, a, an explosive material, again, that uses textile fabrication braiding technology uh, to house uh, explosive materials and um, it provides a signal from one end to the other or it provides a, a means of, of uh, moving, providing energy to um, take down a bridge, uh, do a variety of different activities for demolition purposes. So in World War II there was a lot of detonating cord consumed that Ensign Bickford made here in Simsbury as well as Avon. And as you see, a four-mile link, the material will detonate in one second. <laughs> so uh, very, very fast detonating material, very high-energy material. Um, it's used in commercial mining a lot, uh, detonating cord, especially in salt mining where they're extracting salt from the ground. They'll use detonating cord to break up the material so it can be retrieved from the earth. A lot of other products, uh, hand grenades, um, rifle grenades, gas bomb, all those things during wartime were all manufactured here. Some basic historical facts you can, I guess, see uh, uh, over time, uh, as you can imagine, uh, the company has owned a lot of property here in Simsbury. Um, some we still do. We still own a lot of property here in town as well over in Avon. Um, the over 55 housing area was in initially created by Ensign Bickford. Uh, it's no longer our, our property any longer. Landworks is, uh, is developing that property. Uh, the old grist mill. Uh, great building if you've ever, I'm sure you've been in there for dinner now, it's Millwright's, uh, but a great old building that uh, we no longer own, but um, I wanted to buy it, went up for sale. It's, such a, it's got such great character. Um, so what I'll do now, I'm going to put a short video on so you don't have to listen to me, um, and hopefully it'll get going. This was a PBS special that we put together for our 175th. So some of you may have seen this. If I, can, if I turn the lights off, will it bug you with the camera? No. Might be. A little better?
That's the museum up over here if you haven't been there. I think that is very characteristic of modern corporations is the quarterly largely exist on three-month profit cycles. That, in some ways, is very good because it keeps businesses accountable to their shareholders. But in other ways, it's a real problem because when you're always trying to turn a profit right now, you can lose sight of the long-term goals. And I think that has been one of the distinctive qualities about Insan Bitcoin. It has remained privately held. It's not afraid to invest for the long term. It thinks down the road rather than the next quarter. The average life of a multinational corporation today, the biggest ones you can think of is 40 to 50 years. Here you have a company that has weathered all the storms, and there have been plenty of them, that 175 years could throw at it, and it's still going strong. Incredibly vital, and I think uniquely positioned Another example of the quintessential American institution was born in 19th century New England. Its name, Ensign Bickford Industries. Ensign Bickford Industries Incorporated uh, was founded in 1836 and is headquartered in Simsbury, Connecticut. Well, the technology that Ensign Bickford was uh, founded upon was a safety fuse uh, invented by William Bickford back in 1831 in England, actually. The significance of the safety fuse is that miners would either run down a line of black powder across the, the dirt or uh, they advanced that to filling goose quills actually with gunpowder and the problems with that is it wouldn't burn at a reliable rate so that uh, it would burn really slowly or really quickly and depending on a miner's foot speed he'd get in or out of trouble and a lot of miners got hurt and killed before the invention of safety fuse. So safety fuse brought about a controlled burn speed that was reliable, that saved a lot of people's lives. By the turn of the 21st century, Inside Bickford Industries had achieved remarkable corporate diversity and worldwide influence while still remaining one of the oldest privately held companies in America. Inside Bickford Industries today is really very different than the safety fuse manufacturing company of 175 years ago. But much of it is also the same. Its values, its focus on research and technology, and its focus on manufacturing companies. Our makeup today is a, a variety of different companies. We have roots in the energetics business. We are an ensign for aerospace and defense company. But we also have a very different uh, focus in our palatin business, AFB International, which uh, develops palatin for pet foods and is in the bowls of many cats and dogs, not only in America, but around the world. More recently, after divesting of our commercial explosives business over the past 10 years, we've really branched out in our diversifying and trying to put more legs on the stool of our uh, collection of companies. Ensign Bickford's survival over the last 175 years is really attributed to long-term vision and commitment to the businesses that we're in, a great balance between conservative decision-making and appropriate risk-taking for the businesses that we're in, the commitment to employees, commitment to the, to the customers that we have, commitment to the communities in which we work, and, and importantly, just a high ethical standard of how we do business. Einstein Bigford's um, success over 175 years is related to the company's response to a number of, of challenging technological events over the years that uh, could have obsolesced the basic business, the, uh, the evolution from safety fuse to uh, detonating cord being one of them. Had we not embraced that technology, uh, we would no longer exist. Our time frame is different. I think we can take a slower, more sustained pace um, and think farther down the road, think three to five. In my role, really thinking uh, in terms of decades of 
how this company is going to evolve. And Sony Mitford is the kind of company that in its early days simultaneously created and reinforced the concept of Yankee ingenuity. And over time, in its uh, unwavering commitment to quality and to uh, innovation and to living by its core values of uh, collaboration, vision for the future, patience, adding value to its business. It's also reinforced an old but time-honored Connecticut image of being a land of steady habits. This is a company whose steadiest habit has been vision and patience and whose progress has always been framed by healthy doses of Yankee ingenuity, even when sometimes the Yankees came from far outside of New England. Inside Bedford Industries, leading the way for 175 years and beyond. For more information, please visit us at www. All right. So we talked, uh, oh, oops, sorry. <laughs> So we talked a little bit about uh, some of the other, as uh, Caleb put it, uh, legs to the stool. Um, I'll go a little bit into uh, where I have most of my knowledge, which is Ensign Bickford Aerospace and Defense. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about AFB. Um, let me talk about that first. AFB uh, um, uh, was really the vision for that. Dave Mulsberry, who uh, worked at uh, Ensign Bickford, uh, saw an opportunity uh, and uh, with his background realized that this could be a, a real good business. So we made an investment into uh, a couple guys' good idea and it actually turned into a very, very successful business for us. Uh, uh, we're the largest consumer of chicken livers and uh, dogs love and cats love the taste of uh, chicken livers. So, so the kibble, we provide uh, some of the flavoring that goes on the outside of the kibble for Imes and a lot of the larger pet food companies out there so that's really that business um, and it's a it's a large business today uh, we started back in 1988 and now we have new plants in Netherlands Argentina currently under construction in Brazil so people love their pets all around the world so keep feeding them we like that uh, aerospace and defense as it says up there we started back in the 1950s and it was mainly uh, to, uh, a need for um, uh, strategic missiles, uh, the uh, Apollo, uh, those types of vehicles needed uh, transfer lines, uh, uh, detonating cords that would communicate along the vehicle to do a whole variety of things on the vehicle. Um, so that was kind of our start. We, uh, working with Sandia National Labs, uh, we developed a confined detonating uh, cord. So it's a metal jacketed cord um, that we still use today on a whole variety of our products. So that was our start um, way back in 1950. Obviously, we were, were involved in uh, the defense and NASA. We're prim primarily, I would say, 96% of our business is government business. Uh, we provide products to a lot of prime contractors like Boeing, Lockheed Martin, General Dynamics, uh, Orbital Sciences, all those uh, companies. Uh, but uh, most of our products are, are going uh, to, uh, you know, the government, uh, military uh, types of products. Uh, also launch vehicles, uh, any uh, launch vehicle that's going up, except for the European launches or Russian or Chinese, uh, have uh, our products on it. That brings satellites into orbit. Our, our mission is to improve people's lives, and we say that because everything that you have here in terms of internet, phones, uh, got there because of what we provide in terms of getting those satellites into orbit. Without what, without what we provide, it wouldn't happen. Um, so here's a, a little, little more knowledge. Uh, some of you probably remember the commercial blasting part of the business. Um, that again was the largest part of the business. Uh, uh, I think uh, Tim Ellsworth mentioned the going from fuse to detonating cord as being a, a real step change in the company that was needed. Um, another big step change that really took this company uh, to another level was something called shock tube. 
and uh, shock tube. I have an example over here in the table. This is for mi military, but for commercial, it's the same, basically the same product. It's uh, basically a plastic tube, hollow tube, with a uh, a sprinkle of aluminum and an explosive material on the inside of the tube. So when it's initiated, you basically just see a flash. Uh, you could hold it in your hand. It's uh, but it transfers a signal from an ignition device that would be like a pistol primer uh, to an explosive charge that does work. For instance, in a mining operation, uh, you would uh, have an explosive charge that you would need to detonate in order to move the earth. Whether you're strip mining and coal or whether you're breaking rock, you're doing construction, they're drilling holes, putting explosives in the ground, and they're using a charge like this to initiate the blast. Um, so that was uh, an invention that we took from uh, a gentleman uh, in Sweden. I uh, didn't took, we licensed <laughs> from a gentleman in Sweden. Uh, so he had patented this technology and uh, it was revolutionary at the time, still being used today. Uh, so that was kind of our next uh, step change in the company. Uh, in 2003, uh, we decided to get into a joint venture with Dino Nobel. Um, so uh, we had a, a certain shareholding of the company. Uh, so it was a merger between the two of us. And I think it was a, like a 60-40 relationship. And then in 2005, uh, we decided to divest. So we sold off the commercial mining part of it, uh, Dino which is still on the property today. They are the landlords of the property. We lease the property from them. So uh, they own the property. Um, and uh, what we did is we ended up uh, getting quite a windfall in terms of capital. And we said, OK, it's time to look at what can we do with this capital to, to di diversify. Uh, so with Ensign Bickford Aerospace and Defense, we ended up uh, investing in uh, companies that were synergistic to what we do. So we bought a company called Shocktube uh, Systems in Sterling, Connecticut. Special Devices Incorporated in California and NEA also in California. All related to the aerospace and defense industry. All related to what, what our core business is all about. We also made some other uh, purchases on new platforms Envirologix, uh, which again uh, tests for GMOs in seeds, plants, looks for disease in plants, so they, they manufacture test kits. That's in Portland, Maine. Very interesting business, uh, uh, as well as Danchem, which is uh, down in Virginia. It's basically a toll chemical uh, manufacturing company, so what it does is it does a lot of development work for some of the larger chem, uh, chemical companies. So it'll develop the process for some of these larger chemical companies. So pretty good diversification. We have aerospace and defense, pet food, <laughs> uh, analytical testing for GMOs, and toll chemical manufacturing. So, so I think you can kind of see what the company was trying to really, really wanted a more diversified portfolio. So here are here are basically the uh, five legs of our stool. We still have some property. Uh, we still lease uh, facilities here in Simsbury. So there's a small realty arm to what we do, but continues to be privately held. There's over 1,000 employees, over 10 countries. Uh, we're Missouri, Virginia, Maine, Arizona, California, Kentucky, Massachusetts. So we're located around the US. Um, and you can kind of see how the revenues are broken up between the the different uh, sites or business units. So with, I'll get into my expertise, uh, Ensign Bickford Aerospace and Defense. So we, our primary facilities are in Moore Park, California, Graham, Kentucky, and Simsbury. So in Simsbury we have yeah, about 225 people. Um, we uh, manufacture a lot of uh, products for uh, launch vehicles here in town. Most of our design engineering is here in Connecticut. So most of those, I would say over half of those 225 folks are engineers. Um, so uh, again, a very unique uh, business uh, engineering for specific missions. Um, Graham, Kentucky, it's uh, western Kentucky, coal country. So kind of in the middle of nowhere. Uh, we manufacture a lot of plastic bonded materials, um, so 
we, this is a uh, reactive armor panel, so uh, this would go on the uh, side of uh, an M1 Abrams tank. And what it does, I'm sure you've heard the term R RPG. It's a shoulder launch weapon that uh, uh, our terrorist folks like to shoot at our, at, at our vehicles. And they have uh, armor penetrating uh, uh, tips on them, so they blow holes in the tank and basically spew molten metal. So what this does when it hits this, it disperses the jet and prevents it from basically penetrating the tank. Um, we manufacture a lot of military demolition products. Our special forces use a lot of these and this again uses shock tube and uh, a starter charge and an explosive output for military demolition. So that's, we do a lot of that down in our Kentucky facility. About a hundred and, actually about 135 people down there in 1,200 acres. Uh, and Moore Park, uh, that's a, a recent uh, purchase for us uh, back in 2010. We purchased uh, the Moore Park uh, facility as well as special devices, as I mentioned, and a company called NEA. Uh, NEA is a unique product. It doesn't uh, have energetics in it. Uh, it manufactures uh, release mechanisms and switches. And the release mechanisms are for deploying antennas or solar panels. Uh, on, on satellites, um, so it's a very low shock release, which you need in space, uh, very reliable. So again, it's synergistic to our core business, our customers, same customer base that we deal with. It just doesn't have any energetics in it. Um, as well as uh, special devices, uh, they manufacture uh, products for rocket motor ignition. This is a, uh, a rocket motor uh, ignition system here that we manufacture. Um, and a whole variety of other components that go on uh, spacecraft, launch vehicles, tactical weaponry, and, and things like that. So that's uh, Ensign Bickford Aerospace and Defense. And feel free to interrupt any time you'd like. <laughs> um, so uh, just again, a, a summary of uh, what we do at Ensign Bickford Aerospace and Defense. The aerospace part, uh, the Launch vehicles, as I mentioned, strategic missiles, manned space flight, satellites, spacecraft. The defense part of our business, tactical payloads and components. Breaching, uh, if you're you, uh, familiar with uh, minefields and if you ever watch Saving Private Ryan, when they're coming up the beach, they're pushing tubes into a minefield. That's a Bangalore torpedo system where they need to disrupt the area where the minefield is so that you can cross it. Uh, we manufacture similar products to that that uh, are a little, uh, little more high-tech and don't require you to crawl up right next to the minefield. Um, EOD uh, and demolition products. So uh, EOD is uh, basically uh, getting rid of uh, ordnance, um, unexploded ordnance. Um, and in terms of industrial, we, we also uh, work in oil and gas and metal hardening. So the rail industry uses explosives to uh, basically harden the top of the rails uh, to prevent wear. So it, uh, by detonating, it creates a different uh, metallurgic structure in the, in the metal and hardens it, and uh, you get more wear out of, the, uh, out of the track. So we manufacture product down in our Kentucky facility to do that. Okay. Any questions? I have another video. Everybody doing all right? Yeah? You all right? Want to see another video? Or you, all right? <laughs> Tell me to stop anytime. All right. Uh, here we go. Hopefully, this one will kick off as well. You have to listen to me, though. I'm, I'm the primary speaker here. AMD continues to evolve into a company devoted to improving people's lives. From deep space exploration to the defense of today's soldier, we are the right partner for critical missions. Across most of our history since the Civil War, we've served the U.S. military on mission critical needs and explosives. In fact, the safety fuse that was used in the Civil War is still being used in the U.S. military today. today we're a leader in energetics, known for reliable precision solutions, as well as 
breadth of technologies and applications. More recently, we've expanded our reach into adjacent fields, specifically through some very successful acquisitions. The key to our success is capturing synergies with our core business, both in technology and with our customers. Energetics will remain our core business. Together with adjacencies, we've created greater growth potential. The aerospace and defense market obviously experienced many changes over the decades. And EVA and E's breadth in technology and markets has been a cornerstone to staying strong during tough headwinds and capitalizing on the opportunities that emerge in both up and down times. So where are the new growth opportunities? We need only to look to our core energetics business. Here, our thrust of innovation as we apply core technologies to create an ever-expanding portfolio of products. Our people use sophisticated tools to design a product and understand its performance prior to making a single part. We also engineer our products to work together in higher value systems, offering a solution to our customers that is difficult for our competitors to match. Through all this, we truly deliver on our motto, right for your mission. One of our latest innovations is in our demolition and reaching market, a product we call MPLC, or Man Portable Line Charge. After only months of working closely with our customer, EBA and D introduced this self-contained, easily deployed system. Now our troops have an effective and mobile tool to deal with the threats from improvised explosive devices, or IEDs. And PLC is characterized by power, portability, and precision. It has the power to expose buried hazards, such as IEDs, so the soldier can know their location and neutralize the hazard. It's portable enough for a single person to carry the system in a backpack through mountainous terrain, and its precision allows the soldier to aim and deploy the system when needed. MPLC is right for your mission. Through some of our recent acquisitions, EBA and D now provides a much wider suite of products and technology to support our launch vehicle and tactical missile customers. And we've opened up a whole new market for EBA and D in satellite mechanisms. Also important is our expansion into non-energetic technologies, products that perform similar functions to our heritage energetic devices, but address applications that cannot tolerate the use of explosives. This is important to ensure we can offer customers what they need, not just what we have. This is vital in making sure we are right for their mission. Given the superior technologies and products we've developed for the U.S. market, our allies are hungry for some of the same capabilities. We've been aggressively expanding our network of international representatives and industry partners to channel our capabilities to this market. Just a few years ago, we were present in 10 countries. Today, we've multiplied that by three. In addition, now that we've covered our initial development costs through domestic sales, international promises to be substantially more profitable. We've talked about where and how we see ourselves growing. Our innovation in core energetics, creating synergies and gaining market share and expanding internationally. Underlying and enabling this is our people and their ability to innovate. Our people will be the engine that drives us to higher and higher levels of operational excellence. Our employees utilize lean principles across EBA and D through the use of the Ensign Bickford operating systems. We seek to establish a culture of continuous improvement in everything we do. It's all about delivering value to the customer, faster, better, and with less expense. Whether in our factories or in our offices, each of our employees are actively engaged in driving out waste, eliminating error, and eliminating defects. Our people working closely with our customers implementing new product and manufacturing technologies and 
and leveraging our foundation of safety and lean principles will allow us to provide ever-increasing customer and shareholder value. When you think of Ensign Bickford Aerospace and Defense, we want you to think right for your mission. Right for helping our customers be successful, whether it be in defense of our nation or unwrapping the mysteries of space to the betterment of mankind. We want you to think precision, market diversification, innovation, lean principles, and above all, safety. That's Ensign Bickford Aerospace and Defense. again here. Oh, did it again. Okay, uh, that is, that is it. Um, any questions? How does your company, is that at the very end it says defending our nation. <coughs> yep. Is that, is that what you are just about the U.S. or do you have international, uh, I mean how do you keep it all straight? Well, we're yeah. Well, the, the government keeps it straight. Okay. Yeah, we we uh, we sell to the U.S. We we don't sell to anybody else in the uh, in outside the U.S. The government determines who we can sell to. Uh, so there are NATO allies. We have allies. Uh, we definitely sell our products to our allies, but only if it's uh, vetted through the government. So it's 100 percent U.S. 100 U.S. That's correct. And even we only buy 100% U.S. in terms of the government requires us uh, to make sure that we can purchase all of our materials in the U.S. And it's also covered by what's called ITAR, which uh, uh, in terms of there's regulations on what we can paper, talk about outside the U.S. So we can't send a drawing. We can't unless it's uh, okayed by the government. So there are some very stringent regulations in place that we follow. Um, there are regulations commercially as well for commercial electronics and, and things like that as well, but in our business, you know, we're, we, are the, we are the one that really uh, has those regulations on us. We, re, in regards to uh, pet food, there's not those regulations there. Uh, yes, when we see a rocket stage separate, what are you actually doing? You're blowing up the bolts that are holding it together? Yeah, there's a lot of ways to do it. Uh, we, we manufacture, uh, thank you for asking, that's a great lead in. Uh, this is a product that we manufacture here in Simsbury, and uh, um, basically what it is, this is in a, this metal part, it's a, an interstage. So you can envision the top of the rocket, the bottom of the rocket, and this product here is basically a tube, flat tube, that when you initiate it, there's a small piece of uh, confined detonating cord in here. It expands and basically cracks the stress concentration. So it just cracks it and the, uh, the missile separates. Um, there's also, uh, we manufacture a product called linear shape charge. So it's in the shape of like a V. And it's an explosive charge that gives quite a wallop. And it, could act, it, it can actually cut through the thickness. The jet that's produced can cut right through this. But it produces a lot of shock, a lot of boom. And if you have a very fragile satellite, a $2 billion satellite sitting up in the nose of this vehicle, you don't want to hit it with a sledgehammer. So uh, this is a very low shock way of segregating, separating the two upper stage and lower stage. I think there was a, a question. Yes. Yes. <coughs> Just a, a very basic technological question. Sure. Uh, can you explain the difference between, uh, which I don't, maybe have explained, but uh, again, the difference between a uh, safety cord, detonation cord, sure. and why, and why, like say, on the outside of a spaceship, like you were saying, why wouldn't you use an electric cord? Sure. <laughs> So Safety Fuse uh, uses black powder, which is really a pyrotechnic material. It burns slow. Uh, when you can find it, uh, it can create a lot of pressure and rupture, and, but it doesn't detonate. Um, a detonating cord, uh, for instance, uh, a Safety Fuse burns 
in 10 inches a second, let's say. You know, very slow burning material. Uh, a detonating core travels, like I said, four miles of it uh, detonates in a second. So very different and extremely uh, different output in terms of the amount of energy that's released. Um, so a detonating cord can actually initiate a much larger charge of explosives. The only way safety fuse can is a safety fuse has a, a larger explosive charge on the output end of it. So you know, I could I could give a course now on secondary and primary explosives and uh, <laughs> how all that works, but. I see some heads nodding already. <laughs> I better not. Uh, so that, that's the basic. Uh, so pyro, something that pyrotechnic where you need a fuel and an oxidizer and versus a, uh, a detonating cord, which is a single crystal. Uh, PETN you may have heard of, maybe not. Uh, HMX, RDX, those are uh, military grade kind of explosives that are, are used in detonating cord. Uh, electrical versus Explosives. Why? Why not have wires running on a vehicle? That's another very good question. Uh, wires are susceptible to uh, radio frequency, so you can induce uh, current uh, in wires. Um, and so what they what they try to do is they try to anywhere where there is a a critical attachment of of. Uh, an ignition source. So you have this big Roman candle, right? This huge rocket that uh, if you're in the space shuttle, right? Those big solid rocket boosters. Once you light them, you can't turn them off. Uh, so what they tend to do is they tend to use very inert, safe systems that can't act like an antenna. Um, so an explosive line, uh, you can hear, you can hit it with a sledgehammer, it's very safe, won't go off. Uh, until you give it the right impetus. And uh, so the explosive allows uh, a very safe ignition of those rocket motors versus electrical. But ultimately, the thing that ignites it can be electrical. And what typically what they do is they'll use a device like this, which this is called a safe and arm device. And this is used to ignite a rocket motor. And basically what, what it does is it holds the ignition source out of line. So if you can envision a rotary, something that's on, a, on like a Lazy Susan, right, um, where there's two output charges that are, that are not aligned with one another. So if something were to happen, nothing would go off. So what they have to do is give an electrical pulse, okay, so it arms it, and then they have to give another pulse to actually tell it to do something. And they have another interrupter in line as well. So there's multiple safeties that have that have to happen in order to ignite a, a missile or, a, or, or a, a, a rocket motor or things like that. So that, those are that's some of the very basic reasons why you use a you know an explosive transfer line uh, versus just electrical wires. And at the end, you have to do work. So. If I have to do that separation, if I have to cut something, if I have to ignite something, if I have to do all that work, well, I, I have to go then to electrical back to explosive. So I have to have explosives back in the chain again because it's hard to create the amount of energy that's needed. That's why explosives are, are, are so unique. You, know, you can take just the end of my finger here and it can do a lot of work. Just the material at the end of my finger can produces a lot of energy. So that's why explosives are used, is because there's no other materials out there that really create that kind of energy. There was something that happened back in the 1980s. There was, yeah. yeah. We that, uh, I mean, that was, it was, it was a big one. It was a big one, some people died. Uh, so yeah, back in the, I believe it was uh, 83, I don't have all the history, but uh, yeah, we were synthesizing some material, which we don't do here anymore. Uh, that's why we have our Grand Kentucky facility. Uh, uh, but they were synthesizing a new explosive, and the reaction uh, got away. And uh, there was uh, enough material uh, to create a very large boom that uh, you know, the folks in town, clearly affected by it, uh, blew some windows out, uh, scared a bunch of people. And, uh, you know, like I 
I said, the, the, the booms you hear today are, are small. That's our, some of the testing we have to do. We helps pay for the taxes for everyone here in Simsbury. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, there's, there's no chance of, uh, of anything happening related to what we do here in the town. Very, very safe. Yes? So in your division, does the government come to you that we have this problem of your engineers come up with, or are your engineers yeah. develop solutions a little bit of both, but probably more uh, the former than the latter. It's the, the, we typically solve people's issues. Um, we do what I call basic research as well, uh, where we're creating new things. But uh, again, it's we're kind of a work component provider. We do provide some subsystems. So the, the folks that are really designing whatever the system is, they come to us and say, hey, this is kind of what we need to do, um, what can you do with, with what you manufacture and so forth. So we, we do a little bit more of that, but we do do some basic research. Um, but I, I, call, I call what we do more applied research. Yes? I was under the impression that years ago, well, say maybe in the 50s, 1950s and 1960s, that a lot of the land um, that maybe being developed now for residential purposes might have been used for storing explosive. Is that what, what was that land? What was that land? I don't know. I, I again I'm not sure of uh, what the I don't believe any of the land that's being developed was used for storing explosives, but I don't know. Uh, was it a buffer then? Is that all it was? That, that no, I think it was buffer? just property that was purchased. the history of uh, what that property was used for. I mean, it was all tree property at the time. <coughs> so, uh, I don't know. Yes? I, I met somebody once, once in uh, Chicago who uh, before and during World War II worked in an <coughs> explosives factory. And uh, his building had the roof on hinges so that when there were explosions, it, yeah. it did. What, did, is that, did that ever, was that ever here in any of these buildings or in your Kentucky buildings now? I can talk to what we do today. And uh, what we do today, everything's confined. It's again, it's so small, it's confined within the tooling that we use. So we don't need to, we're not doing such large things where you need to bend the building. Because yes, if, you, if, you, if we were working on this and you had an explosion in here, you'd want to try to vent this room out so it wouldn't affect the structure of the building. Sure. Uh, that, that takes uh, quite a bit of material. But have you heard of, the, heard of this? This is Oh, very much. Yeah, we have, again, there is, we do do uh, remote operations on our Kentucky site where there are blow away panels. Uh, that, that's a typical uh, thing to do in our industry is to, not necessarily a roof, but it could be a wall. It's just venting. You just want to, you don't want to build up pressure. You don't need a lot of pressure to take down walls and things like that. Okay. Start talking about primary explosives now? <laughs> <laughs> well, great. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, there, we, we do have some books over here if anybody's interested. It's our 175th anniversary uh, book. It's a, it's a decent read, so if you want to learn a little bit more about the company, feel free. Funding for Simsbury Community Television is provided in part by contributions from viewers like you. Thank you.